Hello, I'm Olena Balko, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Eastern Europe's Minorities in a Century of Change, a podcast on the history of minority experiences in Central and Eastern Europe during the 20th century. This series is part of the Institute of Historical Research Centennial Commemorations Our Century, Looking Back, Thinking Forward, and has been organized by the Basis Study Group for Minority History. It was made possible through the help and support of the British Association of Slavonic and East European Studies and the Stanley Burton Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Leicester. The study group is a forum devoted to researching minorities in the national and regional histories of Central, Eastern and Southeast Europe and promoting closer scholarly collaborations. For more information, please visit our website at studygroupforminorityhistory.com. On this episode, Professor Orlando Feiges at Birkbeck, University of London, talks to us about the, the national dimension of the Russian imperial past. Orlando, welcome to the podcast. Since the publication of A People's Tragedy in 1996, you have developed a reputation as one of Britain's leading experts on Russian history. Can you start by telling us how you became interested in this particular part of the world? Ooh. Oh, well, thank you. Quite by accident, really. Originally, having come from a German-Jewish background, I was interested in German-Jewish intellectual history. And I wrote an under-dissertation of quite an obscure figure called Ludwig Berner, who I believed had um, been instrumental in the formation of Marx's critique of Judaism in the uh, mid-1840s, and was planning to vein uh, when my then supervisor um, the um, historian Norm Stone uh, said to me look Orlando and he was a Glaswegian he said Orlando if you if you wake up with a hangover if you got problems with your girl and you don't want to battle your day with Hegel and Marx do something in miracle and suggested that I work on Russian peasants and put me in touch with Theodore Shane, who was effectively my PhD supervisor, really. Um, and he sent me, I mean, look, I mean, I got a, I got a, I got a language scholarship from Trinity Cambridge to study Russian. Um, I went off to Russia, Soviet Union as it was in 1983 for the first time. And I think I just sort of loved it in a weird way. I mean, the quality of intellectual life the beauty of the women, I might add, um, the uh, just the excitement of the almost like espionage, like qualities one needed to deploy in order to get archival materials in days when access to um, those was tightly vetted by KGB people in the archive. But there were ways around it. Um, and I was helped enormously by Theodore Shannon's great um, ally, Victor Danilov, who was my mentor in Moscow, really, um, a famous agrarian historian uh, on my first book then on, on the Russian or Volga peasantry, um, the middle Volga peasantry in the revolution and civil war, a book called Peasant Russia Civil War. That was my dissertation at PhD level. And um, from there I went on to write People's Tragedy. Um, thank you. Uh, your research interests are quite diverse, with your books exploring a range of topics, including Russian culture in the 19th century, military and diplomatic accounts of the Crimean War, and the history of Soviet private life and personal experience during the Stalinist era. Your People's Tragedy, which arguably remains your most famous work, is a panoramic account of Russia's revolutionary past from 19, 1891 to 1924. Why do you think it is important to highlight continuity between Imperial Russian and early Soviet history? Mm, that's, that's a great question and one I'm thinking about at the moment, funnily enough, um, because I've been working on a book called The Story of Russia, which is a short history from the earliest times, which will come out next year, I think, in which I um, highlight the sort of ideologies and myths that have structured uh, the Russians' understanding of their own history. Um, shaped the way they've constantly reinvented their history or had it reinvented for them uh, by, by leaders. And so, yes, the question of continuities, I think, is important. And it's one I've always stressed in my work, I suppose. I mean, A People's Tragedy does see the Russian Revolution as 
coming from the lower depths of Russia. Um, perhaps a perspective informed by my earlier interest in, in peasant Russia. Um, and so I always subscribed, I think, to that, to that view that uh, one has to understand the influence of Marxism in Russia through the uh, sort of prism of Russian political culture, customary law, uh, the way to understand ideology, not as the way, not as the set of ideas sort of imposed on Russian society by, by Marx, um, by Marxists, um, most importantly, obviously the Bolsheviks, but to understand ideology as um, a sort of language uh, with, or, or, or set of political behaviors and ideas that were assimilated by Russians into their own cultural and political contexts. Um, and, I, and so that book, uh, I think, started, um, is rooted in, in the assumption that there are deep continuities uh, it, it, across the divide of 1917. Um, and um, I think I've always held to that, to that view. And, and um, you know, there are some basic institutions and ideas ideas of power, ideas of utopia, religious ideas really of power and the, and the, the role of the Tsar, the role of lead, the role of the revolutionary that are deeply rooted, I think, in, in uh, Russian popular consciousness. Um, so I think it's important to uh, emphasize those, but also obviously at the level of the state, in terms of state practice, in terms of institutions like Krugovaya Paru, for example, which I think you can, uh, this, this system of collective responsibility for tax collection or for enforcement of social conformity or for surveillance of potential enemies. I mean, this, this, this tradition runs right through Russian history, doesn't it? I mean, almost from, I mean, really, it's already there in the Kievan period of Kievan Rus. Um, and seems to get reinvented in many different ways through history, but then comes out again in, in the Soviet era as, uh, as, as something both within the party in terms of making the collective responsible for each of their members and therefore obliged to denounce them if they become enemies of the people, but also in terms of the party's um, handling of society, that, that um, whole villages are made responsible, whole classes made responsible for enforcement of revolutionary diktat. Um, and, and, and that's only one of many pra such practices I think one could, one could draw. Um, and, but I think that although I would continue to stress those continuities, I think the danger of that is that you sort of hive off Russia as a separate sort of entity, understandable only by its own history and traditions. And obviously that's not the case. It's a very big society, um, big territory. It's all been an empire that has uh, been very open to the influence of other empires and political cultures, just because it doesn't have any clear um, territorial boundaries, really, and which has uh, developed as an empire in a way that has uh, contained within Russia many different political and, and ideological traditions. Um, so um, there's equally a thing of seeing Russia not just as isolated a sui generis political culture if you focus exclusively on the continuities but there's also the danger that you sort of make a general or universal within the russian empire cultures which are in fact probably more russian than they are ukrainian or more russian than they are tatar or kazakh or, or any other of these complex cultures that make up the russian empire so yeah, continuity and openness to exchange and external influences is a balance, I suppose, one has to strike. Yeah, thank you, actually, for, for highlighting this continuity, because in my own work, I, I often find that in, in the scholarship, it's um, you have two different uh, kind of history narrative, two different languages, two different terminologies, and, and, and those historians hardly 
kind of communicate. And then it's so hard to actually see this continuity in the historical literature because the terminology is so different that people are using like as assimilation, acculturation, modernization, and so on. And then there is really a struggle to, to somehow marry those, those, those paths like in, in, kind of in the way you write them. So I think it's, it's really good that, that you stress and highlight the continuity as well as, as kind of dangers of this approach. Um, uh, yes, and I, I might add, since you're a historian of Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine is, is uh, the sort in, in the crucible of that complex ambiguity that we're talking about, because on the one hand, it's, it's the conduit for so many Western influences into the Russian Empire. And on the other, it's tightly held by Russia as part of the empire and has Russian practices being sort of jammed into the Ukrainian territory uh, before uh, and indeed after 1917. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned this already in, 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 in answering the previous question, uh, but I wanted to ask you also about um, this, the, the way you set Russian history in a wider European or even global context. In your fourth book on the Crimean War, for example, you presented Crimea as the center of an ongoing diplomatic battle between the European great powers, while also being at the heart of an emerging religious conflict between Christians and Muslims in Eastern Europe and West Asia. In your most recent work, The Europeans, you trace the interconnected lives of 19th century French and Russian intellectuals in an attempt to write a history of pan-European culture. What do you think are the benefits of such a transnational approach when it comes to reading Russian history and culture? Oh, enormous. And I think we, I mean, maybe we should start by, I mean, in my view, one of the great weaknesses of the Cold War era historiography of Russia is that because the system was so um, much the focus of historians, um, Again, Russia tended to be studied as a system, as a sort of sealed off entity, um, which politically may be at the height of the Cold War, to some extent it was. But nonetheless, it's, it's a very distorting way of studying a country, um, especially one as big as Russia, as the Russian Empire, or the Soviet Union. And... Um, you know, so the, the maxim, which I think is absolutely true, that, you know, you can't really be a historian of any country if you only know one. I mean, likewise, you can't really be a historian of any country if you only know one language. I mean, you have to know several languages to be a historian of anywhere, it seems to me. And it, Russia, which is, is so big and which has always been open to so many diverse influences, the, the influence of the West coming through uh, Lithuania and the Polish Commonwealth, Ukraine, the influence of the East coming through the Mongols and, 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 and that open border of transhuman, um, you know, tra transmigration. I mean, th these, are, these are like revolving doors into the Russian Empire in which um, all sorts of uh, traffic passes. So the idea that you can sort of steal it off as one system and, and not study it as, as, um, as something open to outside influences is, is, I think, fallacious. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, all too, all too many Russian historians only know Russia. They only know Russian or one or two of the other Slavic languages, maybe. They, um, and so the, the sort of internationalism of or the international context of so much Russian history is, is tends to get shoved to the margins or put into categories they call foreign policy or something like that. And I guess I was guilty of that myself in, in A People's Tragedy. I remember I recently came across Eric Hobsbawm review of it and he, he made the, I think the, um, the 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 fair criticism that the book really was um, it 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 really was seeing the Russian Revolution as a Russian, you know, uh, all Russian phenomenon, um, and I think that probably is a weakness of the book. Um, but um, I, I think that coming back to your question, studying transnational influence is 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 important for for Russia throughout history, 
but there are obviously periods of history where the, its importance is greater than elsewhere. So arguably, you know, you could say 17th and 18th century, it's extremely important because Russia was opening up in a very major way to international influences. And I would say that um, the, uh, the, 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 the 19th century, again, massively important, especially in, in terms of culture. I mean, Russia was entering the European cultural mainstream everything that got taken up in Russia culturally in the 19th century had either come from Europe really, or been uh, reinvented from Europe for the Russian context. And I think in the period after the Crimean War, um, which is, uh, you know, really the period of my book, The Europeans, I think that because of the relatively liberal policies of Alexander II, and because of the growth of the railways, international communication, the movement of people um, becoming much more um, straightforward, despite the distances separating Russia from Europe, I think that Russia really was possibly for the first time being uh, sensibly evaluated and written about by Europeans and uh, properly appreciated um, for its cultural contributions, partly because of. So uh, turning to the issue of minorities, how important was the nationalities question in the Russia of 1917? And how do you think the former empire's ethnic and religious diversity might have influenced the outcome of the revolution in a broader sense? Hmm. That's, again, a great question, and I think it's probably more important than historians realised or admitted in previous histories of the revolution. Um, I think that, for sure, it wasn't the nationalities question that brought the empire down. The nationalities movements, it seems to me, are still best understood as responses to the weakening of the state. But those tensions and fissures had all had been there for a long time in parts of the empire more strongly and politically so than, than in others. So obviously in, in Poland, Finland, arguably West Ukraine, um, more importantly than say Central Asia or in the Turkic speaking areas of, of the Russian empire. Um, but I think that once power does crumble in 1917 and when we think about the revolution in the longer durée of the civil war then I think historians probably have underestimated the degree of, of ethnic conflict and the ways in which uh, the Bolsheviks in areas of ethnic um, fighting uh, exploited it. So Thinking about Stalin recently, I mean, I think that if we, you know, if we think about the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute, I mean, it really was the result, wasn't it, of, of Stalin's intervention in, in the Caucasus for some time and to support Azeri um, Muslims um, uh, at, at, at moments throughout the civil war and indeed in his activities in the revolutionary underground in the Caucasus. So I think that ethnic tensions were, were in other words, part of the sort of um, conflict, uh, many conflicts at many different levels that come to the surface in, the, in 1917 and are then weaponized um, in, in ways that I think we probably still have quite a long way to go to understand. Um, so, um, you know, you would probably um, know much more about this than I would moving into the sort of 1920s and 30s. Um, and the, the work of your generation, I think will be increasingly important in highlighting these sort of uh, tensions and fissures and how they played into social conflicts and into um, state policy in particular, and how they then uh, fractured again and became weaponized during, uh, during the war years. Um, this is something for, for future research, clearly, I think, in, in, and wasn't really possible uh, 
um, when I was, say, at your stage of my career, um, in my in my in my thirties, uh, which is when I wrote People's Tragedy. So, at that point, I think it's fair to say that historians of my generation were were were, were very Russia centered. I mean, we it, it's taken thirty years of the you know post Soviet um, sphere for I think uh, my generation to recognize how how badly. Um, educated, we, we always were about the non-Russian parts of the Russian empire. I mean, it's an, I, I, and, you know, I mean, people, you know, you say, oh, something comes up in the news, you know, something in Kazakhstan or something, and, and they turn to me for answers. And my, and my knowledge is, is extremely limited. But I think, um, uh, so I think that, you know, the Russian empire being so big, I mean, it's a very complex, uh, diverse space. And, um, because of the way it was studied in my generation and previously, um, it, you know, it's tend to be very Russian centered. So I think that the great um, steps forward being taken by your generation will, will bring out these factors much more. Yes, indeed. It, it seems that the scholarly attention has, has moved, has shifted to, to the peripheries. And, 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 yes, and to, say, to say the truth, Ukraine now is, I think, in, in the, the kind of, you know, is a very important point because of the openness of the archives. And a lot of researchers from the world are coming to Ukraine to study, like, you know, imperial and Soviet Indeed. past because of the access to the archives. So we are all looking Indeed. forward to some new and exciting research coming from here. And I think it would be really great. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I mean, so I remember... Years ago, if I can just add as a footnote to that, um, Hiroaki Kuramiya, who's a good friend of mine, I think was probably one of the first Soviet historians to, to, to discover the riches of the archives in Kiev and elsewhere in Ukraine, which you know, contained materials quite impossible to get in, in Russia itself. Yeah. Um Turning to my own work, I wanted to build some parallels. And um, so in my own work, uh, I examined the foundations of early Soviet Ukrainian culture and discovered that a lot of the processes implemented from 1917 onwards had been largely determined by the imperial legacies of Russification and cultural as well as political centralization. Artists mm. and authors in Ukraine searched for ways to create a truly national artistic and literary canon, which was nothing to build upon often meant having to, uh, to start from scratch. When we speak of Russian imperial culture, how much diversity was there? Were there any non-Russian voices in the imperial canon? At the same time, when we speak about the post-revolutionary period, how did the Bolshevik approach to the national question affect cultural production in the peripheries? If you can, of course, comment on that. Well, that's a huge subject. And, and again, your knowledge is, is probably better than mine, but um, the before 1917, it wasn't just um, say Ukrainian language that was uh, suppressed. I suppose is the right word for it um, in terms of publications and in terms of school teaching and so on. Um, it was also Russian hist um, Ukrainian history, which was tightly tightly controlled by by censors. What what narrative was available to historians like Kostomarov, who who came from a, a Ukrainian background and um, was writing from a populist perspective that would throw up many issues unpalatable to Tsarist censors. So within tightly controlled limits, there were, I, I think, still spaces allowing for the expression of the Ukrainian um, story, but I wouldn't want to say that it was a, a liberal, <laughs> a liberal environment for Ukrainian historians or U Ukrainian writers. Um, obviously, it, it loosened up a little bit, but at the same uh, at the same time, there were strong tendencies of Russification. So that tension was was always there, and I and I think again, this is an area that we can we can hope to find from your generation more research coming through because. If there's anything that could be said about the Tsarist system of censorship, is that it was he was pretty ineffective, and there were lots of ways around it, and lots of ways of sort of working in the margins. And um, so, some of the old stereotypes about you know Russian oppression of Ukrainian arts and literature 
um, we, we might well have to rethink and re-examine in the light of, um, of more evidence that we can get about, about the ways in which Petersburg controlled Kiev and its hinterland culturally. Um, so it is, but I clearly the, the overall narrative of Russia was still, you know, set by Petersburg, wasn't it? And I think that continues to be a problem in Russian-Ukrainian relations today in the sense that if you think back to, say, the millennium uh, of uh, the Grand Prince Vladimir, Volodymyr, as the Ukrainians would call him, um, and how one marks the continuities between Kiev and Rus and either Ukraine or Belarus or Russia. This is, um, you know, again, it's, it's you know, Putin's idea of, of this, uh, uh, beginning with, I suppose, his speech um, and a role in the unveiling of the Moscow monument to, to the Grand Prince in 2016 in Moscow, you know, the great big hideous uh, sort of kitsch Russian nationalist uh, statue in front of the Kremlin there. I think, you know, his his narrative is very much that, as you know, that, you know, you, you, the, the Ukraine, Belarus and Russia were one, one people, essentially, one family, uh, one nation, one civilization, and that, that therefore Russia has a sort of sphere of interest at the very least in Ukraine or can... Um, disregard some of the territorial boundaries recognized internationally because of this cultural heritage, this religious civilizational uh, Rus uh, Mir, as he sees it. Well, I mean, you know, that, 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 and that was always there in, in, in the, in the and if you look at the, um, the pre to the isling of the original statue of Vladimir, or Vladimir as he was then in in Kiev in uh, 1853, wasn't it? Was it 1853? That I think it was about then. That that's mm -hmm. or was it later that that statue was put up um, uh, over you know on the on the banks of of the Dnieper overlooking Kiev. Um, that that became a sort of focus for, for Ukrainian nationalists because they already had perhaps, you know, a subterranean, but nonetheless um, a very um, a very alive uh, historical consciousness, maybe not published and maybe not on the surface, but nonetheless, you know, clearly groups forming around this statue to, to stress the autonomous traditions of Ukraine. So I, I think that the current conflict in terms of the understanding of where Russia and Ukraine sit vis-a-vis -vis each other in the overall history of their shared and unshared civilizations, um, you know, it's always been there. It's always been there. And I, I think that, the, that that discourse needs to be probably better excavated from the pre-1917 period to um, understand the strength of Ukrainian feeling around these symbolic entities of, of, of Ukrainian identity um, in order to better understand, I think, uh, the, the, the nationalist movement in Ukraine or the U Ukrainian feeling of, of, of a shared history that set it apart from, from Russia and maybe connected it more to the West. Um, thank you. Let's turn to, 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 to a later period. After the Second World War, the Soviet leadership pursued more aggressive centralization and Russification policies that marked a major shift from the more tolerant and decentralized cultural climate of the 1920s. For your research on repression under Stalin, you looked at several hundreds of private family archives and letters. Did you find any indications that an individual's ethnic background or their nationalness, as recorded in the Soviet passports, might have played a role in the suffering people had endured during the late Stalinist era? Or did ethnic-based persecution remain a feature of the 1930s when many of the state's policies were designed to deliberately target minority populations throughout the Soviet Union? Yes, certainly. I think that the, the movement against so-called nationalist movements or not within the party circa 1930 
is the start of a more generalized campaign against ethnic minorities that we see spilling out into the national operations of 1937 to 8 deportations of Poles, Chechens in the war, Volga Germans, etc. So I think there is, going back to the early 30s, an ethnic um, Russia, uh, uh, a Russian chauvinistic, xenophobic sort of ethnic category imposed on the terror. Now, historians will argue how important that was. Um, and um, the, the, the all sorts of ways one can interpret that. Uh, but it, I think it's there from, from the early 30s. But I think that the war plays um, a crucial role in bringing out the, the great Russian um, nationalism of Stalin post 45. Um, you know, Stalin does talk about um, Russia instead of the, the Soviet Empire, instead of the Soviet Union. Uh, or, I mean, if you read Miller and Gilles's conversations with Stalin, it's clear that he's already, he notices he talks in sort of other pan-Slav terms, uh, but talks about Russia, not about the Soviet Union from, I think, 19, his first meeting in 1943, maybe 44. Um, and that, that's clearly there you know, from the, the, the famous speech of, of uh, May 45, where he, he praises above all the, the contribution of the great Russian people as the, as the leader of the, the Soviet peoples, but also as, as, you know, the liberator of the world in this messianic conception of the, the, uh, of the Soviet Union, which becomes intrinsic to the Russian nationalism of, of Stalin's late years. Um, and then, of course, the um, victimization of the Jews in particular is, 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 is the key. Um, not that there hadn't been anti-Semitism before, I think, and I think that Stalin was profoundly anti-Semitic, um, but um, go, going back to his um, you know, very early activities in, in the Caucasus, um, but the um, anti-Semitic policies of uh, the um, the Zdanovshina, the anti-cosmopolitan uh, campaign. I mean, I think that is um, something that is a product, a product really of, of the war, a product of this sense of um, the great Russian chauvinism um, that um, in that confidence of the regime post-45 becomes a marker of some sort of imperial, new imperial identity for, for the Russians as ethnic Russians. And, um, it, it, and, the, the, and the, the Jews become a sort of new enemy of the people, I think, in that taxonomy of, of ethnic cleansing. So I think that uh, the part, you know, what, if, if you're Yevray in your passport, say post 45, that will affect you both in terms of, for example, will you be allowed back to your city of origin if you have been evacuated? Uh, and in, Petra, in Leningrad, uh, post 45, I think probably the answer would be no. You know, the, the, the reintegration of people who've been evacuated is a, a sort of social cleansing or ethnic cleansing really going on post 45. And certainly in the interviews we did for the Whisperers, that was um, something that many Jewish interviewees uh, remarked on, that they felt that that was part of their experience. Um, and then I think in, in, a, in a way that is uh, quite interesting, and I'm not sure if there's any literature on it, I think that the, the awareness of the Holocaust um, creates um, and, the, and the, the internationalization of the Holocaust um, awareness, I, I guess from the early 1960s, um, uh, creates a great deal of friction with the Soviet imperial Russian nationalist discourse of the war in which really the Russians like to see themselves or 
as, as the main victims of the war, you know, they, they, they paid for, for the liberation of the world with their blood. It was 20 million Russians, not 20 million Jews who died in, in this narrative. And so that moment, you know, around the, um, the, the Shostakovich Baba Yar um, uh, symphony, what, 62, isn't it? Uh, and the Yevtushenko poem. I mean, that that is sparks off, I think, the, a new uh, uh, strand of anti-Semitism, which feeds through into the 1970s, because the 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 the, the Jewish uh, story of victimhood and suffering from the war is occluding the the Soviet narrative of Russia's suffering. Um, so the Jews are only recognised as suffering on Soviet soil in the Holocaust, insofar as they're Soviet citizens. And there's a denial of their Jewishness, as if they were, as if they were being rounded up by the Schutzmannschefter and the Gestapo and put into camps and killed, because they were Soviets. They, you know, it was an ethnic, it, it was an ethnic racial war, quite obviously. So um, there, there are many sort of um, episodes and changing form of this uh, uh, nationalism, whose enemy becomes the Jews in the post-1945 situation. And I guess that's probably on its course. I mean, many people would say now that, you know, in, in post-Soviet Russia, the, the role of the enemy of the people, the role of the, uh, the Jew has been replaced by, by, by the Muslims. It's the, it's the Chechens and the Muslims who are the sort of the other the, that uh, are victimized in this way. So clearly um, it's the, it's 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 a phenomenon rooted in Russia's imperial identity and the problem of how it deals with the others the minorities within that that is um, you know related to security related to ideology related to the politics of control and um, a culture of nationalism and social conformity that is, politically imposed. I think there is a there is a compound identity of Soviet Jew, which is different from say American Jew or German Jew or you know refugee Jew or Israeli Jew. I think there's a um, there's a close relationship between early Soviet culture and the Jewish moment, if you like, of uh, former Bundists, former Jewish Marxists and socialist revolutionaries throwing themselves into the Soviet experiment um, and not really conscious of themselves as Jews. So one of the most interesting family histories from the Whisperers for me was a um, set of interviews I did with Ida Slavina, um, whose father was a former Bundist who joined the Bolsheviks in 1920. And as a senior jurist um, was asked to take part, was asked effectively to give a legal justification for the, for the gulag as it was then developing in a dissertation and refused to finish his work and ended up getting arrested in 1937 and shot. But the earlier phenomenon that's interesting in that is that the reason why he had been asked to write this justification is because he'd previously written uh, a series of articles in which he had Maybe, maybe not justified, but try to explain the uh, pogroms against Jews carried out by the Red Army and uh, workers in places like Vityebsk in particular, circa 1920, as a sort of natural um, product of the class struggle. He had said, well, of course, um, if you, you know, if you're a Jewish factory owner um, and, and uh, you know, you're going to uh, receive violence from the suppressed workers. And even though he'd been a Bundist and he was a practicing Jew, he, um, he, he, he sublimated his, uh, 
his Jewish identity in, in a Soviet one in that way. And Marxism, you know, clearly facilitate that for many Jews so that they, they cease to become aware of themselves as, as Jews, perhaps, because they're so invested in, in the Soviet project. But obviously the, the war the, uh, and the Holocaust on Soviet soil blows apart, I think, for Soviet. They can't any longer pretend they're just Soviet citizens. Um, and because of the creeping anti-Semitism institutionalized by the Stalinist regime after 19, well, arguably after, after from the 1930s, but uh, quite clearly from uh, circa 1944-45, uh, that that makes it impossible for Jews not to have, okay, still a compound identity, but one where, you know, they are separate conscious entities. I'm a Soviet citizen, but I'm also a Jew. I have an affinity and a loyalty to the Soviet state, maybe, but I also have an affinity and certain loyalty to the new Israeli state. And so when, you know, Golda Meir turns up in Moscow and all these Soviet Jews come out, because it is the expression of this new sort of duality, if you like, in Soviet Jewish identity, which creates a new security threat as far as Stalin is concerned. Thank you. And, and finally, uh, could you perhaps share with our listeners what your current project is about? Hmm. Well, um, as you may know, Aliena, I have this year retired from teaching. Um, I've enjoyed my time, but I'm going to turn 62 this autumn. So it's time for me to do the right projects, I hope. Um, I, um, in terms of historical research, um, I am actually, when I've put aside this book, The Story of Russia, um, I am turning to my own family history, um, not necessarily with a view to publication, but because um, I have been made aware of documents uh, in the last year or so that are just fascinating. My great grandmother, who was um, a very wealthy uh, Jew in Berlin, was part of a consortium of elderly Jews um, offered exit visas by the Gestapo in exchange for buying shares in a shoe factory in Guatemala, the Guatemala transfer, it is known as. And um, so I'm going to be involved in some research trying to get to the bottom of that. She did make it out of Germany the, uh, in 44. It, it was a large sort of extortion racket run by the Gestapo. And, and there are other examples of that. The Wittgenstein family from Vienna had a, a, a similar experience. Um, and my grandfather um, is at the center of that research uh, because he was, having been in Dachau uh, in 38 after Crystal Nacht, he came out with my mother and his immediate family in 39 and then took part in the war in the British Army as an interpreter. Um, so I, I'm going to do some research on that. I think just, I mean, um, you know, if I can speak personally, you know, my sister died last uh, in 2019 and I, don't, I only have one surviving relative, my uncle. Um, so I feel this is the time to, to, to do that. It's very nice to be able to apply my historical expertise, whatever, it, if I can claim that at all, or in interest anyway, to my own history. That's really quite exciting. So it's a hobby, and I'll do that. I have various other hobbies. I have written a play which will be produced next January 2023 in London. Um, and um, who knows what else I'll do, but I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. Good luck with everything, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, and good luck.